Well, thank you, and uh, as Beth said, my name's Kevin Fife, and I uh, always am asked in the beginning to say a little bit how I got into this, uh, working with stone, mostly walls, and old house and barn foundations. Um, in, oh, I'd say, I think it was 79 and 80, I worked at St. Paul's School those two summers um, in Concord, and I worked on the landscape uh, maintenance crew, but there was a full-time mason named Carlos from uh, Ware, New Hampshire, and oftentimes they would need an extra person, you know, just to help do a project, like maybe do a brick walkway and help him with that, because he was an older gentleman, and, or maybe a cobblestone or some uh, stonework on one of the buildings. So that was the really the very beginning of how uh, I got interested in that. And I always liked to be outside ever since I was a little kid. And I always liked doing uh, artsy things like drawing and, and uh, just really had a big appreciation for the outdoors and nature. And of course, stone is about as natural an object as you can work with. And this is at Shaker Village. My wife, by the way, Polly, did the, the uh, slide, so I can give credit to her. I am extremely computer illiterate, so. Um, I was gonna talk, like, for the first half of the slides about the history, and this is pretty much in New England, but it all pertains to New Hampshire also, and just kind of how walls kind of came about. And, for example, um, everyone always thinks, you know, that, this was open area when we got here. Of course, as we all know, it was all forested. And then when the settlers came, it was clear. Now it's reverted back to woods. But of course, with progress, things are kind of going the other way again. But the very first walls, when they first came over, were mostly out of wood. For example here, this is 1620, one of the early offenses. A fence, by the way, is a term dis to hold back uh, cattle or sheep as a barrier or it could be a boundary. And in the beginning, they were wood. And this one here is uh, pretty much uh, chestnut because when the settlers came over here, a lot of them from Europe, especially England, Scotland, Ireland, um, as they cleared the land, they had to have some kind of barrier for their, for their animals. So this was called a zigzag fence or a worm fence, the 10 foot sections. And sadly, in the 20s, we had the blight here. We lost all our chestnut trees. And actually a lot of the uh, uh, timber frames were made out of chestnut because it was very durable and, and uh, fairly light for a hardwood. And this is remnants of a zigzag fence in Connecticut, you can see. Right here, I was zigzags through the woods, which was once a pasture. And how this came about was they had the fence and they started clearing the land and they said, boy, it's pretty bony here. So they just started rolling things under the fence. <laughs> and they were like, oh geez, maybe we uh, should really use stone. That's permanent, the wood isn't. This is another picture, I believe that might have been the author of the book, which is in the back, Good, Good Fences. And uh, this one was in Newtown, Connecticut. You can see how it meanders through the, what now is woods. And um, to back up just a little bit, of course they used wood, but as they cleared the land, and on a larger scale, they used uh, stumps that they, that they pulled out of the ground and usually with a team of oxen or a team of horses. Oxen were a little more, uh, more powerful, a little more um, slower, horses more jumpy. And this, this, this was uh, a job for somebody that could really make a good living. 
They got 25 cents a stump back then. And that was like phenomenal money. And if you look here, this is a stump fence. And then there's a buggy here and a horse. And this was the, the field here. Uh, this is the field side here. The stone fence and then the wood line. And then they um, started using a combination too. This one was down in Concord, Mass. It's called a compound fence because it has a stone wall and then the uh, wood on top just to give it more height. And this would be like functional, like if you had cattle or horses. And then as they you know, kept clearing the, the land, the quickest and most functional wall they found to be what you call a farmer's wall, which was only one stone wide. And this is a very old remnants of a stone wall down in New Canaan, Connecticut, 1686. And did they move those uh, Well, there's a couple of slides coming up, but there's several ways that they move the real heavy ones. Uh, like with a stone boat. But anybody know what a stone boat is? They just, they were usually about 30 to 36 inches wide with like two to three inch hardwood planking. And some, Sometimes in the mill they'd start so it had a boot, you know, so you could drag it and it wouldn't catch. And then um, in the 1800s, they would use a, a plate made out of steel. A lot of them were made up in Maine. And they would um, hook it to a team of oxen or horses. And they would roll the stone onto the boat and then bring it to the wall for a boundary or for, for, uh, for animals. Or it might have a dual purpose also. Some of them are made in Detroit now, too. Yeah. <laughs> Whoops. Are yeah. they really? Are they using the old auto plants for that? Are they? Or um, even snow walls are made? Actually, on some of the walls I've repaired, once in a great while you'll find remnants of old horse drawn or stuff like And I actually did find the head of a stone boat. And it was in pretty good shape. You know, I'd been there many, many years, and they just rolled it up in the wall. And I was digging with my little excavator, and I heard something. I could see it was metal. And, and it was, uh, I think that one was made in Berwick, Maine, I thought. But this is called a farmer's wall also. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the, uh, again, they're only one stone wide, but as you notice, the stones are long and they graduate up in length as they come up so that you kind of build like a pyramid. Everything is like this, so that the center of weight and the gravity is right in the middle. And like this stone has not only the width, but the length, so it's tied in on the ones below it. And this looks kind of like ledgy stone, which is good because it can distribute more weight. But this was very common because... Uh, they use this to divide. This was probably a pasture, this. And then you can see this wall went through here and the barns up in the back. So they could rotate for uh, grazing or maybe they might have tilled that pasture one, year, one part of the season and then, and then uh, put the cattle in there and then grew crops on the other side, maybe corn. And to answer your question, here's a stone boat right here. And they're dragging the stones over with a team of oxen. And, and this is when they initially built it. And then years later, you can see right here, it's still there because it was built well. This is another farmer's wall. A lot of times they'd use a, a long, nice faced stone here on the end because most likely this was a a gate post so that they could butt up to it and have a gate. And again, you can see there's a division of pastures here. And this one goes down and over the hill. This one comes in. Um, I do a lot of the farmer walls, the one stone wide. And the real heavy ones you initially put up 
today with a piece of equipment, but back then there'll be a couple of slides coming up that use different ways to lift them up. But even today, you get them up on the wall and it's a lot of handwork, like flipping and locking these into position. It, you don't go for looks on a farm as well as you notice, a lot of these are kind of rough looking, but you get them to lock into each other, that's the trick. And they'll be there many, many years, as you can see. And here, this is kind of hard to see because it's a very old photo that was in the book. But this is called a gym pole derrick, in which they had a main pole. A lot of times they'd use like a big tree. And then another one here, and it, this one you can see more clearly. This is more conventional at an old quarry, I think was out in the Midwest. And this is a huge block of granite. And they restored this one. And through a series of pulleys and cables, and then they would have a base that it would spin on, and they could, they could uh, set really big pieces. This one, this photo was up in uh, Tamworth at the Cleveland House, and when they built the road going up there. And how they lifted things, you didn't have to get under them per se. These are little dimples in the stone Right here you can see, and right here. You'd use the old way to uh, drill by using a stud drill, which I have a couple in the back. And uh, at the end of the presentation, I'm gonna I'll show you some of the tools I use and we'll split the piece of granite. But they would have what they call rock tongs, rock tongs, and they could grab the side. They're almost like ice tongs. And that way they could drag out, you know, with a team of oxen or horses and then get it close and then they could use the gym pole there it can just put them into position. And a lot of the stones going up there on the right side of the road up in Tamworth were big. Um, this still is a farmer's wall, but some referred to it as a lace wall because of all the holes in it. This one's more loosely fit, but yet structural. And you see the sheep here in the background? And they're doing their job, they're staying away. The, the purpose of them holes is twofold, is to intimidate the sheep. And the other one on the islands like Martha's Vineyard was because of the really high winds. Because if, if you plugged all these with chinkers in here, it'd be more of a solid mass, and believe it or not, it would fall over. So that was the purpose of that. And this was an artist uh, sketch, pen and ink, out of Massachusetts. Um, this showing the lace wall again with the holes. The sheep looking at us that at the wall. So. This was um, down in Martha's Vineyard, another lace wall. This one's more beefy because it's holding in, you know, him, that big ox. And then in the background, actually, is a double-faced wall. It's a two-sided wall, which I have some slides to discuss that. But uh, one of the things that, about building walls that my biggest pet peeve is poison ivy. <laughs> I don't know if this is exactly poison ivy, but it sure looks like it could be. And it, snakes, snakes too. Oh yeah, snakes don't bother me. Poison ivy does. At least you don't have kudzu up here. <laughs> this this was a, a homemade type pulley system up in Maine, the turn of the century, in 1904, and it was homemade. And these guys were pretty clever because you can see here you got the stone boat. And then you got a team of horses and the guy holding the team. And they used a um, tripod here too to be able to lift things to get it over. And then they used the rock tongs with the pulleys. This is a huge double faced wall with a lot of big stones in it. So uh, he apparently had a lot of walls to build around his fields. But that was pretty neat.
double face. Does that mean there's two stones to one? Yeah. That means, a, yeah, I have some slides coming up, but a double face wall means that both sides are faced and that the middle is all filled in. And it's, it's coming up soon, I think, and uh, I'll explain the reason why they did a double face. This was down in Stonington, Connecticut, 1650. So these are really old walls. And it was a very bony area, so they put the stones to use for a couple of reasons, both to clear the land. You can see even on the surface still there's a lot of big stones and ledge. Like this big one here, they probably just moved it enough with the team just so they could work around it. Or they might have said, well, we can't budge that one, so we'll start our laneway here. <laughs> so, but this has a whole series of pastures in it, so they, they probably had a lot of sheep and uh, rotated pastures around that way. By the looks of the property, it was probably very little uh, tillable land there. And this is a type of farmer's wall, but it's called a ledge wall because they used all, this is all ledge here, and they picked all the um, stone off the surface. And of course, um, they go for height. So they could roll these right up on edge. And as long as they, like you have these real big ones here, like a kicker stone, is holding back as it goes down the hill. <laughs> And there's actually a lot of walls in uh, like Great Britain that are, that are called wedge walls, and that's how they build them. You take all the stones, you lay them vertical, and they all wedge into the bank, or they can be freestanding. And believe it or not, a wedge <coughs> wall is stronger than any type of wall. And uh, a friend of mine, Patrick McAfee in Dublin, Ireland, actually showed me how to build one once. Very interesting. But I, I like working with this type of stone because it's, uh, you can get a little imaginative too. You know, a lot of people ask who built all the walls, and it, it wasn't necessarily just the settlers that built them. Like, this is a, a, a pen and ink of uh, Shaker Village. You got the brother here with all the, the young kids, and they did a lot of the work of, you know, the lighter work, like gathering all the filler stone and helping put them on these wooden wheelbarrows and, and uh, building walls that way. Also, another people, other people that built a lot of the earlier walls were actually slaves, especially in southern New England. Those that could afford um, a slave would actually have them do the walls, even a few by the Indians. And then the very wealthy might have slave and actually hired help for a more finished wall, a more ornate wall, like a real cut granite type wall. And these are at Shaker Village. Um, a lot of these I've worked on and fixed, <coughs> excuse me, like in the foreground. A lot of them had fallen off, I put back. And, and then, then the one in the background not that particular section, but either side are fixed. And the Shakers were really uh, clever people, as we all know. They've been, had a lot of inventions and a lot of their, uh, their spiritual, spiritual, spiritual type people. And this is the meeting house up here, which is the first building you see when you come up to the village. So. As you come up, there's field stone, which was kind of rustic. And then there's a mix of granite, cut granite and field stone. And then when you get to the front, it was all cut stone that was really fit nicely and originally. But of course, that was 1799 that they built that. And a lot of water comes off the hill, so they have moved. But you can still see like this section, that how, how nice it was when they first made it. Are they native to New Hampshire? Did they come here from somewhere? England, I think. Yeah. 1799 is when Canterbury Shaker Village was started. Originally, it was like 4,000 acres. It was a big piece of property. Now, I think it's like 600. Yeah. 
this was at the village. I fixed all of this in the foreground. And this whole section here from the old gate all the way down to here, I redid. Now, you had asked about a double-faced wall. This is a double-faced wall because it's, it's faced on both sides and they're two parallel walls. And then in the middle, they had a couple functions. I got rid of a lot of stone, for one thing. And the other purpose of all this is all that is what's called the harding, the filler stone, is supporting both walls. So like when you build a double face wall, you, you do one side, then the other, you do the middle. And always in the middle, you never go higher than these stones here as you're building up so that you can tie over that and web it all together. And another reason for the double wall was like, this is the house here, and this might have been a garden area, and they might have had animals over here. So, and it was for easier maintenance also, like to till or to mow with a horse and a rake. This was a granite wall in Warner, New Hampshire. Um, it's right along the road, I think off 103. And you can see how over time that these, like this big pine tree is getting big and starting to push a little bit. The roots, they wreak a lot of havoc with trees. And I always get a kick out of our friends that like come from the West or Midwest. And uh, they say, I don't understand how they built all those walls around all those trees. And then you have to go through the whole thing, how they got there in the first place. But This was a, what they called a barnyard wall down in Old Lyme, Connecticut, around Civil War. Um, it's a double-faced wall because you've got two planes here that's separating from the road and the barnyard. A lot of nice flat ledgy stone, which is really good. What's, what's ledge made out of that stuff? What, Limestone and granite? Uh, probably sedimentary stone and, yes, yeah, some granite. But usually ledgy stuff. Granite is more uniform when it was uh, created. That's why it's so desirable, because it has a uniform grain. And stone, a lot of the lead stone, like some of the projects I've done, literally, you'd be digging in the ground, there'd be so many nice parallel planes. And it was hard ledge. If it's soft ledge, you don't want to use it for a wall because it will just hold moisture and crumble. But this is all good hard ledge. I've been down this way before, and there, it is really nice stuff. It's good hard stuff. Right, don't build the mill up, so why does it settle? Uh, it was originally, but this is an old wall, and see how it's kind of coming in the middle? So it pushed this way and this way. And that's another reason when you always do a double face wall, all the middle has to be really tight. Because if you have anything like size of your fist and it moves, then that section is, this, these capstones are going to fall inward like they have here a little bit. But again, it's an old wall, so. And as we all know, we have plenty of frost around here, so. <laughs> New England, especially northern New England. This was in... Uh, Yorkshire, England, and they brought some of those principles over here. Well, they are the same principles. Only in uh, Great Britain, they, they always put what they call the copestones on edge for two reasons. That, that gave more height, and the other thing was that it intimidated the sheep so they wouldn't try to jump up on the wall. This was an estate wall. I don't know where it was. It's probably New York or Connecticut. But I like it because it, you see these are one stone wide. It, so it ties the front and the back together really well. And it keeps a lot of water out by having a solid mass. This was a good end. This is a, a double faced wall because it has two sides. And it's battered, which you should do. Not everybody does, but I always do. See how the wall leans? It's wider on the bottom than the top. It's going to hold its own weight once again to the center of the wall. And this uh, imperative thing in a wall building is you always have 
uh, two over one and one over two so that your joints are broken even on an end. So you got this big base stone. These two stones go that way into the wall. Then you have what you call a through stone. And then you have this one, which is going way back here. So now everything is crisscross. All the joints are broken. And this was cut stone. You can see the feather wedge marks here. Granite, probably. Looks more like granite. Um, <laughs> this was in Warner. Actually, I did the uh, old house in Barn Expo in Manchester over the weekend. And this guy was going through the book I had, um, Good Fences. And he says, that's my dog. <laughs> I said, your dog? He goes, yeah. We were out on a walk with the town there, and uh, he asked if the dog would run through the cowslip. That's what this is called, a, a cowslip or a cow style, so that a farmer could get through, but a cow couldn't, you know, from one pasture to another. Or in some cases, they might have made it a little wider and just fenced it off, and if they had to move them from one pasture to another, they could. This is a step style. This one was down in Litchfield, Connecticut. The farmers did this so that, like this is a big double face wall, so that you see this piece of granite goes from there all the way to here. So, so that if they had to get from this pasture to this one, they could just step up over the wall. And then of course these come this way when you come back. So um, those were functional that way. And these were cemetery step styles down in Goshen, Connecticut. But this is in a retaining wall. So your grades up here. So these are built on the side just so they could get up and maintain the cemetery. And uh, this is remnants of an old double wall. In 1874, this one was down in Bridgewater, Connecticut. Unfortunately, it was the beginning of the end of stone walls because barbed wire was invented. And it was actually was invented by, I forget the guy's name, but he was from New Hampshire. And he moved to the Midwest. But they kind of, um, actually I have a, a cousin did the same thing, but you see they put an old uh, piece of, uh, I think probably chestnut in the middle of the wall. Then they used a the barbed wire to get more height. And he did that, I noticed, in some of his walls, too, with some old uh, railroad ties. Because his walls weren't real high, but they were double-faced, and he has a lot of cattle. So he put some, he did the same thing. So it is an old technique. But... Did he use the barbed wire? Yeah. Yeah. But this was, you know, 10 years ago, not... 200 years ago. <laughs> but, um, stone was also used for cellar holes. A lot of the old houses, of course, had stone for two reasons. It gave a foundation for the house, and it kept things um, cool in the summer and from freezing in the wintertime. And even sometimes they might have a wall that bumped out three-sided as a cold cellar so that that would do the same thing if they didn't want it within the cellar itself because uh, that would keep it at the temperature of the ground. Stone too and granite was used. This was in Newtown, Connecticut. This was a big dam. I think this was like 25 feet high, I thought it said in the book. And it was like 100, over 100 feet long. Um, a hole had gotten that high. They probably used a derrick for that, to boom them in there. Yep. The thick was at the bottom, more than double, obviously. Yeah, it was probably very big, probably 15 feet wide. And when you build a wall like this magnitude, there's a lot of material, like three times what you don't even see, because you have to have what you call back in stone. So, and uh, for stability and drainage and strength. And like some of these in the front may not look too big, 
but they're called tie stones. They may go in like six, eight feet into the bank. Uh, another function of the farmer's wall was the um, from the barn to the pastures. This was called the cattle run. These were narrow farmer walls, two parallel walls. They're usually only eight, ten feet apart, just enough to get the cows down through. You know, at the end of the day and bring them in during the night for milking. And this is much wider. This is called the laneway. This one was down in Rhode Island. All lead stone, small stone. But this was wider so that they could get a team of horses or oxen and a cart to, uh, like, if they hayed these fields or had a crop to, to gather. And... Uh, of course, there were a lot of critters back then, so if they got out, they had to have a place to put them. You know, if someone's cow got out and no one knows who it was, whoever was in charge in town of the animals, it's like they have an animal control officer today. This was 1842 in Auburn. This was called a town pound, so this is where the animals went whenever uh, there was a stray. On Fisherville Road in Concord, they still have the old town. Yep. Right down by uh, Cobra Ruthia, yeah? Yep. yep. And Swenson Granite, what better place to get it? <laughs> uh, this was one in, this is in Durham, 1709, but it's really well built. See how they tied this in, and good base stones. And, and then they use big stones to cap it off, and you have the door here where they bring the animals in and out. They showed those in Williamsburg, too. Yeah? Yeah, where they rounded up the animals and they had to put them somewhere <laughs> until the farmers came and got them. <laughs> well, each town had a different budget. See, this one's much more rustic. This was 1804 in Chester. And uh, actually, the one in Danville they took down. I don't know why they did that. But they did re-erect another one in recent years, I noticed, by the meeting house. Or it wasn't a meeting house, I think just the library. No, that was Fremont. They put one in the back, that's where it was. I think that is the, the meeting house. Here's another uh, town pound, Martha's Vineyard, 1877. Now this one, they used cut granite for the gateway area in the header, but this is only one stone wide. Some of them were two stone wide. But yet, of course, they got to face it, use all the best faces on the interior so that the animals wouldn't try to climb out. And I thought, one over two, two over one, remember how I said you, you uh, dot your I's, cross your T's? So you have one here and these two, so that there's no vertical joints that are completely lined up, like right here. So in other words, if this went all the way down, either retaining or freestanding, it's going to buckle. And this was all fit really nice. It's a really nice fall. Okay. That was, a, you know, talking about the history of walls in New Hampshire and New England. And then I was going to talk about some of the things I've done. Is there any questions? Or? Yes? Can you tell how old the stones are? Oh. Like 17 or 16, how do they tell that? Um, and I have some uh, books over there, but that's a good question. In, from about 1830 and back, the first way how they cut granite stone was what they called a slip wedge. And what it was, it was, a, it was done with a cape chisel, which kind of was like a triangle. So when you look down on the top, it was more like this long by that wide. It was more like a groove or a slot instead of a round hole. And they had two flat wedges and one flat, um, what should I say, two flat shims and one big flat wedge. So on the side, it looked more like a triangle, which I could show you a picture of that. I don't have one on here, but in the book. And actually, I picked up a book over the weekend at the expo, this guy from Massachusetts, always has these very unique books just about, you know, certain things. And that's all just about that, 
the old way of cutting the grain. In. So I picked it up. But uh, that's a good way to date things. If you see that triangle mark, it's 1830 and back. And then like 1830 to 40, sometimes you'll see a mix of the, of the uh, regular feather and wedge and the slip wedge. So if you, have a, if you have an old house, that would give you some indication of if, when they cut it. This was down at the uh, mall in Washington, D.C. I don't know if you remember, we went down um, 1998 for the Folklife Festival. It was New Hampshire, South Africa, and Romania. And Swenson sent, sent down a whole tractor trail load of granite for me to cut. So I was demonstrating cutting granite for people. What, what was the festival? The Folklife Festival, Smithsonian Folklife Festival. Yeah. Oh, it was really interesting. It was, but it was hot. <laughs> hey. Oh, we won't see that for a while. I w ah, I know. That's for sure. <laughs> this was out behind my house. This is an old patent hammer around 1910 that was um, made in Concord, and that's for dressing stone. I don't know if you remember a lot of the old steps would be kind of smooth. They used a patent hammer. Or like some of the sill stones you see under the house. I don't use it anymore. My an old friend gave me that. But uh, like if you go up to the Granite Museum in uh, Barrie, Vermont, they have hundreds of them because that's that's what they did. It was tons of granite cutting. What is the weight of any of these stones? Granite weighs 160, 164 pounds a cubic foot. So. It's heavy. Yeah. This, this was a um, wall I fixed down in Danville behind the old meeting house at a cemetery. They used big stones on edge that had width, and then they used big cut pieces of granite for the cap, and uh, then they just chinked in between with smaller stone. And right here was a nice old gate which was all, uh, you know, handmade. But r there was a tree like this one right here. It was an ash. And uh, what it did is it pushed on this post so you couldn't close the gate anymore. It lapped over like six inches. So we pulled out the stump and then put it all back together so they could use the gate. My dad helped me with that project. <laughs> Are you seeing vandalism? In New Hampshire? Yeah, I mean, I know people are knocking over the graves to run up they're hurting the walls, so it's too strong for them. No, not. I haven't never seen anyone, like, physically try to pull down a wall. But what is common, this course is back from the road, but um, I've repaired a lot of walls where a vehicle went off the road and the ice and snow or, or was drunk. I've done three walls that have drunk drivers. I mean, it was pretty bad. I mean, they hit that hard. And, but, but we tried to put back as best we could the original stones and the, keep the, you know, the moss and lichen to the road, the roads over here. And of course, this tree wasn't here when they built it. It's a huge sugar maple now. But, you had mentioned the old stone arch bridges, which are quite a remarkable feature. Oh, yeah. Outlive all of our new bridges. Yep, I agree. The ones in Hillsboro, there's a lot of them. Yep. Yep. Very uh, nice craftsmanship. All those arch bridges over there in Hillsboro. I think there's at least six in Hillsboro. This was a cemetery wall in New Durham. It had collapsed, and I had to put it back, and the headstones were so close. So I had to be really careful. Fixing that one. This was after I finished. It was about four and a half, five feet tall. And I used all the original stone, but some of the original were really not very big, so I brought in some more. Just tried to match it as best I could. How do you get all those flat edges? A lot of this was cut granite. And there is some stone like these mixed in. 
And uh, I had to get access from the neighbor and then go across their property. And then this was all grown up, so I had to cut all the trees and brush so I could work. Because, of course, you can't work up here. And you can see this huge tree here. That didn't help. So, There's might. a huge grade difference there, isn't there? Yeah. Between the cemetery yeah. and... You sometimes wonder why they built cemeteries where they did. I don't know. <laughs> is, it, is this work a matter of weeks or months? No, this didn't take me long. A couple of weeks. But take it all out and put it back. Do you have any before and after ones to show just how bad it was before you... No. I'm lucky I have what I have. I don't even take pictures of most of what I do, but... You don't do puzzles when you're going to find your relax. <laughs> you know, people always say you must love puzzles. And I say, well, yes and no, but I said the problem with a puzzle, only one piece is going to fit. Whereas in a wall, so that's oftentimes the case. However, there's a lot of other places I could use this stone if I wanted to. You know what I mean? But... This is after it was all done. That's just beautiful. This is what it looked like with all these trees over here. So I had to clean that out so I could work. I had to sort my stone and be able to spin around with a machine in there. This, this was a wall in Canterbury, which originally was a one stone wide farmer's wall. And she moved the whole colonial from across the road to the other side because it was drier and it had a nice field in the back and it was all of course part of her property. So what I did is I reused a lot of the stone from the old foundation to build this wall. Plus I brought in other stone too. Because when you take a real rustic wall that was only one stone <coughs> wide, now this is like three and a half and about three feet high. So it took a lot more stone, of course. This was on the other side of the drive. And then, it, see, it blended into the old farmer's walls. But this was the driveway over here. And this was a stone culvert. There was seasonal runoff, so I had to make sure the water didn't wreak havoc with the wall. And why did you make it that thick? Did, did cosmetics? Uh, well... There is a rhyme and reason to that. Your base should be basically as wide as the height, minimum. That's not the case in Great Britain, though, but they don't have frost. A lot of their walls are taller and narrower, and they taper them quicker. Um, usually as you come up, you go inch to two inches in height, you know, per foot, batter back into the wall, at, at least an inch. Over there, they go two, maybe two and a half. What's with the post? Oh, she, these are just good end pieces, and she thought she might put a gate on there someday as you come into the house. Yeah, those are big posts. Those are uh, they were either 10 by 10 or 10 by 12, and they go in the ground like four and a half feet. So what does that weigh then? <laughs> a lot. Right, who's the mathematician? So. What's a hundred? Well, well, they weigh about sixteen hundred pounds a piece. And she wanted with the with the feather wedge box. I don't know if you can see that on the edge. So you need a big piece of granite. The longer they are, and the more, you know, like ten by ten or twelve by twelve, price goes up quite a bit. Because obviously, you need a big piece of granite. This was out behind the house at the same uh, wall, but I was looking for a piece I had to put in here. And this was just a farmer's wall, and she wanted a big double wall to divide um, the front from the back. See, the house is to the, behind the bobcat, and this was the field. So it, it still is functional the way it would have originally been. It's just a double wall now instead of a farmer's wall. And this was to walk through here. And then way down here was going to be a, two more big posts with a gate because she has horses and, and uh, sheep, not sheep, uh, goats. And uh, 
She wanted to do a riding rink up here to rotate into that pasture. Stonewall mainly New England or are there a whole mid Midwest? Uh, New England, New York, Pennsylvania. But not Ohio. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't been out there. I imagine there's got to be some. But definitely as you go more w uh, west into the Plains area, there's nothing. I don't believe. And there's not a whole lot in California, you know, on the west coast. Well, once you had barbed wire and so on, people cheated. Yeah, and just geologically, in well, a lot of part of the country, there is no stone. Yeah. They, didn't have stone they didn't have stones to get rid of. There, like Tennessee, I know there's walls. Yeah. Because when I was down in Virginia, and parts of Virginia have walls, Kentucky has a lot of limestone walls, you know, as you go more south. But, um, you know, there was a part... Yeah. Oh, there's New England without a doubt is the most rich in stone walls in New York. But um, well, they say if you add all the miles of walls in New York and New England, there's still more in Ireland. There's still more there in Ireland. What do you put for? A, uh, what do you do for a footing under a wall like that? This all I dug down a foot and a half. This is all inch and a half crushed stone. Yeah, so that's what I've been doing. I was just wondering. Yep. Oh, you always want to have a good base. A drainage. Yep. And it gives a little bit of flex to the wall. If it's on... It's hard to imagine. <laughs> flex. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, you know, frost heaves. Well, if you have it, st crushed stone will still freeze, but it doesn't freeze as much. And it can give a little more. Whereas if you had this... Just in the loam, that's going to be a solid freeze to it. What would a 200 year old wall have as a, as a base? I mean, what would they have been using? Um, a lot of times they just use a lot of little stone oh. and some big stuff. That's a good point. Like in some towns in um, Massachusetts, I read, it was required that you had a three foot rubble base mm. before you even built your wall. And then it had to be three and a half feet high. And there was actually a guy that came around to make sure all your fences are up to snuff. Mm -hmm. And if your animals got out, you got a fine. Mm -hmm. and, if, and if you got, I think this is a little extreme, but <laughs> if, if, you, if you got caught meddling with someone else's walls, someone even went to the extreme, they thought it was a town hanging, but I don't believe that. <laughs> That'd be a pretty strict guy to do that. This one was at Shaker Village. Um, you know, it was built really well, but again, this like this this water would come down and see how they kind of fell back on themselves. So that's sort of a before picture. Yeah, I actually do have a before in this one. And then we're combing out with the excavator, and then I left the base stone so that I could put them in a different row as I was sorting the stone. And then, see then, when I, we combed out all the little stuff, and uh, by the way, this had a really good base under it. He had, there was all, a lot of little stuff. But just to play it safe, and so we could get a drain, I dug it out, put crushed stone in there. You think yeah. how much work that was when there was no equipment to use? Oh, I know. <laughs> yep. We, I've actually done workshops where we'll have a team of oxen. Labor was cheaper. With a stone boat <laughs> to, to make it really it traditional. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how does that not be back breaking? Oh. Yeah, my back was sore that week. I did have a back <laughs> break. But I don't wear one very often. I just try to it pace myself. Really But I got to, I, um, well, I was reaching over because the bucket's right above my head. The, uh, I tried to use all the weathered faces so, you know, it looked like we had not really had to fix it. Do you know of any way to accelerate the growth of lichen? <laughs> well, to age a wall? Some say if you use buttermilk yeah. and a slurry of uh, manure, yeah. and maybe even a little flour and you mix it. I've heard of the milk thing. 
Yeah, buttermilk. And another person said, she was a gardener, said that this used a miracle grow because it had enough to make it green up. Okay. And you know, I just, I've, if I buy uh, something that, like some granite that's not real weathered, I just put it out in my uh, field for a year. And with all the, when the grass grows up, it gets a nice green patina to it, especially if we've had a lot of rain. And a lot of it depends on the face of it. If it's facing on the north, northwest side, it usually ages up pretty good. This was, as we were finishing up, doing the back. What's your estimate of the cost to do that kind of wall? Let's say per foot or yard or oh. mile or what? It depends on the operator, how much I got to pay him. I, I usually use my own machine, but these are big stones. And we had to do the bays and they had the material. And then sometimes if you don't have that material, age stuff is kind of expensive. But if you just did a lot of like excavation around your property and they're not weathered, you know, it's cheaper. The weathered stuff costs a little more. Because you try not to scour it all up when you're working. Is that Shaker Village as well? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Get ready for it. Well, I can give you a ballpark figure. Can you? Okay. I'll talk to you afterwards. Um, this is called a thumb. Now, my small excavator, I have it too. And you can see how small that stone is in relationship to the, to the machine. That's like probably 17 ton machine. But, but yet that will pick up like six ton stones too. So it works, it's just, you can pick up things like this. And uh, you know, we had to dig this out of the ground. We couldn't get a strap on every piece, of course. But in some cases where you have to not scratch a stone, every stone would be picked up with just the corner of a tooth and then strapped and then put into position. There mustn't be too many people that do this kind of work. Well, a lot of people say I got rocks in my head, but I said no. <laughs> I said I enjoy this kind of work. Do you know if you had any competition or none? Oh, well, not a lot, but there's some. You know, um, it's it's hard work, but it's satisfying work when you get something finished. You know, it's the kind of job where you got to have patience and you got to pace yourself. You can't just pull. I've watched, if I do a workshop, like when we did the cap, it, had, it was this wide, okay? And a guy had a stone this wide, but the hole was only that big. So he just pushed both sides out to get his stone in there. But I said, no, that's not what you do. I said, we just put up the string. Now you bump these out. So you just got to be patient. And you got to try to work smart, not quick. Um, you try to move the stone around the easiest way that you can. Like some stones, like a big rectangular stone, I don't try to lift it. I'll, I'll flip it up and then walk it like this. Or if you get a stone on the wall, you can just kind of... Right. Yeah. What is the reason for the holding? Oh, this was an old stone culvert for the water to go through. So I used the original stones again, how it, how it was. It's a turtle pass. <laughs> yeah. A turtle That's a woodchuck crossing. <laughs> Which, by the way, when I was working on this, it was a nice sunny day, and I was working on the cap, and I was working my way down this way, and there was a big hole, you know, it kind of, graduated down because I hadn't set those yet. And I said, what the heck? And there was a woodchuck in there sleeping. So <laughs> then another time we rolled out a stone, not on this wall, but one out back. And I had another guy help me uh, with a different excavator. He curled his nose. I said, what's the matter? And there was a huge skunk was sleeping in there. So we woke him up. But we didn't get sprayed. You did. What, you work in the winter too? No, it was, in, it was um, during the day. They're nocturnal. They come out at night, pretty much, skunks. If you see them during the day, that's not a good thing. They might have rabies or something. This was just as we worked on that. 
with a crushed down base and the drain. The new fake ones are cemented together, aren't they? Or water? Oh, you know, I, I have people ask me that they go buy these products at Home Depot and stuff. I won't do it. I, I like that cultured stone and, and like two by two concrete, two inch patio blocks or whatever. I, I just like to use the natural stone. And some of the products that are out there, it's not a heck of a lot more to use the real thing. And it's going to last. And like a lot of the new products, the dye wears out and pavers and things. But this, this was at Shaker Village at the foot of the hill, and this was another stone culvert. And there's one on the other side of that tree. And this wall is only like a foot high down here because of all the runoff from the road and the field. And... Uh, what we did is we held it up so all the water would stay back here in this swale, whereas before it all went right into the wall. What kind of damage would you anticipate seeing from this winter's snows? Uh, the... You know what's another issue is plows. You know, the wing. When the, oh. when the banks get so deep and they go by with a big state or town grader and they don't know what's in there. so. If I ever build a wall near a road, I tell the people to take like some eight foot saplings and leave them out a couple of feet and put a ribbon on it, you know, orange survey tape. So it's, it's like out here. Sure. And that saved a lot of walls. But the tree roots won't lift it? Exactly. No, just a little sapling that you cut. Okay. You know what I'm saying? It's gonna grow up every year. So that it sticks up this high with a, um, some survey tape on it, like orange, pink. Is she saying oh, 20 years that going to grow up and lift it? No, I mean just a branch that you cut and you put there in the fall oh. and then you pull it out in the spring just so that, oh. so in other words, it acts as like a reflector so that people, when, the, when they plow, they won't go in there. It is, but, but you're going to cut it off. So... <laughs> This was, you can see the batter here on the wall, that double face wall. This was after I got it all finished. It was 350 feet we did there. This was, this is, I call a glorified farmer's wall because it's face to the road, but yet real rough in the back. And this was some beautiful granite posts. And these were, these had the um, slip wedge marks in them. They were before 1830. And we actually had to take this apart, that other big farmer's wall, and set it back because, or maybe we took this one out, came over here, I don't remember, but either way, when they built the restaurant, they had to be able to get big trucks through there. So, but we used all the original stone. I just had to make it wider, that's all. This was a farmer's wall, an old barnyard wall I did for my neighbor. They had all fallen down, we put it back. This was the cows used to come out in the back. And she wanted a couple of steps to go off to the side. It was durable as he died. You find plenty of work to do. Oh yeah. Yep. The accident. Oh yeah, that's common. I imagine this one here, I'll get a couple calls probably. This was the farmer's wall in the back of the barn. This is a, another neighbor. This was a farmer's wall, one stone wide. There was so much stone there that I made him a double wall. So. Is that a lake in the background? There's a tennis court. Or, oh, yeah. right here? Yeah. No. Okay. This, this field I used to slide in when I was a kid. But this was a big field out here. That 93 is like probably three quarters of a mile behind there. This was the next neighbor up. I don't know. This happened. To, this is a double wall. This is an old house, early 1800s probably. And then they did a patio up here. But they wanted to end like the old way because there's a driveway here now. 
this was to the roadside. They, I created these walls so they'd have a gate. This was an old meeting house in uh, New Durham. All the stones were missing, basically, because they worked on the sills on the bottom, and we rebuilt a solid wall underneath, which is pretty strong here because this is all ledge. So all these stones go from ledge to the sill. There was crushed stone under here for drainage. And then you'd hit ledge also, a lot of places there. Then they, the house had to breathe underneath, you know, the meeting house, so we put these vents in there. Is it a stone cellar? No. No, it, it's as deep as it is. It, it, yeah, it's stone foundation, but it was only like this high, at the higher. Yeah. Because it's all ledge there. That, I believe that, how, that building was moved there. This from an, one? No. Oh, the other one. That one. No Whoops. Does it have to this building. Oh, okay. Actually, yeah, that's right. There is a big stone pound that's over here. That was a huge double one. And I think that guy built that huge pound for $8 when it was built, something crazy. I read the literature, it's either eight or 80. It was, and it was huge. It's like this tall and it goes on a hill and it's like eight feet wide. It was big. What is the main thing that destroys the fields, the, 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 the walls, freezing, freezing? Uh, you know, a lot of things now. Uh, freezing thorn is the key one. Trees, if you get a, like a big tree close, the right. roots, um, vehicles backing into them or going off the road, um, widening of roads, construction, this progress. <laughs> like you got a beautiful wall like this, of course not this high, but you know, if it has like this big, and they had to pop through the middle of it to get the driveway in because they subdivided a big farm or, and a lot of people sell walls and take them out of state or out of town um, which by the way is illegal in New Hampshire if it's a boundary you're not supposed to move a boundary wall however interior wall you can with permission from uh, well if it's yours you don't have to have permission but I guess Permission, it's, there is a few towns that have an ordinance that no walls can be removed. I think there's only like three in the whole state. But. This is uh, my truck I use, and this is my skid steer, as well as a little excavator for moving. That's how I set all this granite. This, by the way, was, excuse me, do you have a question? I was just going to say, so you leave the equipment on site, if you were home on the weekends, if you were following. Yeah, oh, definitely, yeah. But um, this originally was all little tiny stones, and it went straight into the barn. And what I did is I curved it so that it would be easier to get up here. Mm -hmm. The old wall came here. Yeah. And then this wall came over here. It was pretty hard to get up in there. That was, the guy I worked for actually was a landscaper. I don't really do plants anymore, so he did all the plantings. This was at his job. Um, the, he, he wanted it to look like, like an old pound type looking wall or a cemetery. So he just wanted a bunch of long pieces of granite, like right here. He, and he didn't want too, too many shims, so there was a lot of grinding and chipping and using my point and my chisels a lot. This was like nine, whoops, excuse me, this was like 90 feet right here. And then this was going to be a grade change here. It's going to be all brick. Yeah, he did a nice job of planting. 
This, this was in Raymond. It was, uh, this is the Pennsylvania stone, the Shaley stone, New York, Pennsylvania. When I got down there, all of a sudden there's this house that's like six feet of concrete. And she wanted to bring it down into the grade. So I brought in all this fill here and then terraced it up and uh, did a walkway and a sit sitting area. There's a little water feature over there. And then we used granite deer isle on the top. Is that a little bell in the right hand side? Right there, oh, yes. Right there? Yes. Lights. It's what? Lights. Lights. She would always sit here and have a coffee in the morning. She loved Dunkin' Donuts coffee every day. <laughs> She'd actually get me one too in the morning. <laughs> um, I didn't do the plantings. I don't know who did. I don't, but they did a nice job when it was. A, They're gorgeous. I, I did the walls, and this was like 10 years later. I came by a young couple. They, they had moved closer down this way. So did you design it, or was that a part of the landscape? Yeah, I always do my own designs. Well, sometimes, um, no, I, I actually did design it. But she, this woman, she was so funny. She was born in Ireland. She had a, you know, she was, she was a firecracker. <laughs> if you joked with her, she'd call you SOB. You know, it's like, <laughs> she was very funny, but. So I, I laid it all out for her, but she couldn't see it on paper. So I said, that's okay. I, I have a friend who's a good landscape architect, just so she could see a visual a little easier. And then um, I had to lay out everything, all the steps with strings and everything, cause, so she could visualize it. But. How'd you get so many flat stones here in this country where there's no shale? Well, this, these came from Pennsylvania. Oh. Yeah, like this is six feet long, this big one to sit on. Is that a New Hampshire house, though? Yeah, it's in Raymond, yeah. This was when we got finished. This is like a granite apron piece here. Um, this was all recycled stone. These people had collected granite for like 12 years. Plus I brought in an awful lot. And there was an old farmer's ball here, but it had been missing for many years. And she wanted to put some kind of wall back. They wanted a finished granite wall. Is that an old house? Yeah, 1742. And then uh, this, this was a runoff here and I had to build a stone culvert. So this is all one piece. It's like six by four by 14. Mm -hmm. And the whole wall floated over that. Mm. And she wanted a mix of stone and granite. Like this is stone, that's stone. These are stones over here, but mostly granite. And she wanted like long ones mixed in. And this, this was some thin pieces she wanted mixed in. What, is your, what was your base? Stone. No, I meant that's just a little bit above the grass, under the long piece. Under the right yeah, here? right there. Yeah. That's a piece that goes way in the ground. Yeah. After these walls are built, because of the weight, um, is it true that this half of it, is it all you see? The other half is. Uh, it depends what kind of wall. Like if I'm doing one along a, a river or something, yeah, because. If, if this was in the water, you would have to have half of it buried and then big rubble stones here in the water. Of course, with permits and everything, but because it gets a lot of a, you know, movement with the water, the current, especially in spring coming. But no, there's another whole row under here too. Yeah. Yeah, you have to bury the part of the bottom of the wall, no matter what kind it is to kind of lock it in. So, so it's like, what, one third is on the ground, so it's all of or the half and half? No, a third more so, or a little less even, depending what type it is. Third, if it's a, if it's a short wall. So those things won't, like, sit 
settlement sink, like eight inches or something? No. No. Nope. That's all the more reason to use wide stones on the bottom as much as you can. And also to have a good base, crushed stone base, or good flat stones. For some older homes, I can see they've got like rock um, chimneys on the outside. Yeah. So you get two, three floors of rock stacked on top of each other. I mean, that must settle and sink over, you know, seven years here. Oh, it's going to move some. But if you build a good base, that's a key thing. If you, when you go through all that effort, you want to have a good base. If you were building a chimney two stories high, how, what, how deep would the base have to be? I don't do chimneys, but I would guess at least three, four feet. Yeah. Concrete. Yeah. Whenever I do like pillars like this, uh -huh. we usually will, will pour three feet of concrete. And I make it a little wider than the pillar itself. In some cases, even some steel in it just so you can tie it all together. And like when you do the pillars, you want to make sure, some people build them separate, so that just the pillar alone and then the wall butts to it. But I like to build it so it's tied in together. Which, in my opinion, is a lot stronger. But. Now, this is the last thing I was going to talk about. This was a job I did a couple of years ago at the Fellows in Newberry. And uh, I'm not positive, but I think it was probably <laughs> built. I know that some of the walls were at least by the uh, um, Crescentes, which were famous masons over that way. And I believe this wall was built originally like around 1920, some give or take five years, 10 years. And they built it very well, but this was a combination of retaining and freestanding. This was called the pebble court wall. And you can see how much it pushed just because of the water in the back. But was that poured concrete in the top? Or? Yeah. yeah. It was, yeah. That's how they yeah. got us the flesh. They purged the whole top. I don't, I think that was probably original, but so they went from the front to the back by just buttering up the back of this stone, leaving this all mortar into the back of that one. But they didn't want to put it back quite that way. They wanted more stone to expose. And there were pieces, you know, stones coming off when it came down to the gate house, uh, to the main house. What happened there? Oh, the mortar was old and failed, and so it started to fall apart. So we had to, everything had to be taken down, cleaned, free of mortar, all by hand, no scratches, no machines. And then, you know, set aside and then put back. Like these pillars were built well, but they started to tip because of all the water. Well, they let all the trees grow in around there. They didn't want the lake to do any more. Fells estate? Yeah, well... Lake and Secretary? House. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And over here on the right is uh, Incianthus, which I think is the oldest in the state. So we had to work around that big time. And the branches are really stiff, so you couldn't really tie them up only so much. But you can see here, we had to take them all out by hand and then clean them off and then put them all back. They wanted all the weathered faces back. So like you can see here, this wouldn't be acceptable, put that back. And of course that's what restoration would be, is that to make it look like it wasn't rebuilt. We had to take the stairway out, that had to be fixed because they were tipping the wrong way back into the steps itself. So we took them off in the order that they We'll put it in and put them back. We use straps so we wouldn't scratch them. How many men does it typically take you to do a job like that? How many members? No, how many men on a day's crew? <laughs> oh, I usually work by myself most of the time. Even with those great big pieces that you're... Yeah, around with the but sometimes I'll have help 
with one or two people. That's all. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Yeah, like my dad helps me sometimes, or another contractor. In this case, because it was so much to do, and they had a deadline, we had to get it finished, I hired another mason. Because this, all this had to be mortared. Were you happy with his work when he got through? Yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah. They had, they had interns, he had his past summer, cataloging all the little stones in the property in the flower gardens. <laughs> laying, yeah. Them all on yeah, each summer there is someone over there that, as an intern, that's great. Yep. Usually a landscape architect, designer, student. Yeah. Well, actually, by the way, this is after we rebuilt those. What happened was, is, is they twisted this way, because there's a wrought iron gate that goes in there, and they twisted, so the gate hadn't been on there in many years. And also, I bought these pieces just up the road, because they matched perfectly, to the because it, it was so close to this property. They matched perfectly in color and everything from another old estate so that we could use them for the, mm -hmm. for the gate. Because you had a pintle in here, and then it pivoted on a, on a dimple down in here on the base. This was just a side view. Yeah. You see, it, there was a lot of going from pillar to pillar, and there was a six inch reveal. So everything had to be plumb. And you know, I couldn't batter this wall because that was the main, that was the original construction and layout. So everything was plumb. Like, see right here was a six inch return back to the wall. And that was kind of the case in the, the whole layout. This is after we got that pillar rebuilt. And again, they had them independent. So what we did is we tried to tie them into this wall also. So they'd be more stable. Right? Yeah, that was after we rebuilt that section and the stairway. And then uh, this piece here would be for the pintle for the gate. It's a side view looking the other way. What are the horizontal pipes? Is that to let moisture out through? Yeah. Um, just to alleviate some of the hydrostatic pressure. Mm -hmm. And if this ever got a lot of water in here, so that it could come out. Yeah. And we. <coughs> oh, working with other masons and kind of just by doing it sometimes. If you see good work, you can learn by repairing it. It was done well, it's just, this, you know, Mother Nature, sometimes after a while, it's just too much. This is, they get a lot of weather up there on the hill, Newberry. This is after we finished. So you, you, so you could see the stone more instead of just doing all mortar on the top. And then we put, they had a lot of crushed stone in behind and fabric. That's another thing. Of course, they didn't have that product back then, but this, this fabric that goes behind it allows the water to go through very easily, but keeps the dirt out. So when I took it apart, there was a lot of dirt in there that would freeze and thaw many years. You gotta use that material over those tubes? Yep. So everything, is completely just stone in here, separated from the dirt from the bank. So I put the fabric up on the bank before we even start building. So it's all nothing but stone from here to here. This was after we finished that section. The other thing is we put granite down on the bottom as a base and let the water go through here. So it has, and it has you know, there's a couple of feet of crushed stone below it, so it's... Another 300 years. It should last yeah. pretty yeah. good. This was starting from the pillar the other way to the other return. And that's it, actually. Wow.
Well, thank you. Th these are the, some of the books that I got pictures out of, so I want to make sure they got credit for that. Good Fences, The Granite Kiss, uh, Sermons in Stone and Stone by Stone. All really good books, which I have in the back for people to look at. And then I was going to show you some of the tools, and uh, I was going to split a piece of granite. Okay, so this process of using uh, feathers and wedges with a rounded hole like this was 1830 and on. Prior was the slip wedge. So many years ago, they had what they called a, a star drill, which I meant to bring over with me, actually. But, so they, they had to do all this by hand, of course. They didn't have power tools, and they didn't have air tools. And, and uh, so they would just take that and spin it and turn it and hit it with a sledge. Yeah, the smaller one? That, that was the original first type. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So this was the first one right here. It was two-sided. Then they went to the four-sided. That's how to kind of get the star drill name. So they would have to turn this and hit that. And I would think it would take quite some time. I imagine if these were sharp, though, this, this could be split, you know, fairly quick. And then, like in the quarries, they had really big star drills in which a guy would swing a sledgehammer. And, um, and then I think about the turn of the century, they actually came out with a steam-powered uh, drill, which helped a lot with a lot of people. And then the electric tools, and now in the quarries they use air. But anyway, this principle was used where they had to cut stone. And they would use like ledge outcrops, or they would use uh, big boulders that had some grain to it. And like at Shaker Village, I know of many places where there's big boulders where they just split them and made a lot of nice square pieces out of it. So, um, using this method here, this of course is called the, the wedge, and these are called the, the feathers. This, this part is flat to go to the side of the wedge, and the outside is half round to go to the outside edge of the hole. So of course these would go in this way, so that as the as the wedge goes in, it's going to pop it. If you put it this way, it's not going to do anything. All it's going to do is chip out the top of the stone. So these would go in and uh, it'd be a whole series. I mean, this process could be used on a short piece like this or like for a granite post or to split like again on a boulder. Now that these are all set, if, if you score a line, which I use my tr tracer over there, which is a carbide bit, um, what that does, it creates a fault line, so you get a straighter cut, but it's not mandatory for if you're not going to do a dimensional piece. So if they were just trying to break up something, you know, a big boulder, like in, maybe they're doing a cellar hole and it was in the way, then they would just drill the hole, just to get rid of the pieces. You know, make smaller pieces out of big ones. But on the other hand, if they were doing like um, a granite sill, or maybe steps, then you're going to want to score this. So, the uh, tricky part to popping it is you've got to get equal pressure on everything. And you can, you can uh, hear it by the pitch, by the, by the sound. Like for example, see how that, see how that got a little higher? See how it got higher? That means it's getting tighter. So that means I gotta go back to this one. So I just keep going back and forth till I get equal pressure. Then when it's just about ready to crack, it's like you put a ice cube in water, you hear like a pop. Then usually the line will start and you just want to kind of chase it a little bit 
So whatever side it's going to want to start, I'm going to chase it that way. See, that one's pretty tight. Mm -hmm. But see, this, this wedge is just a whisker bigger than that, even though it's the same. By the way, this is a 3 8 hole. So you have to use a 3 8 feather wedge, just like you'd use a 3 quarter for a 3 quarter inch hole. Because if you don't, if this was bigger, it's just going to pop. It's not going to do anything. If it's too small, it's just going to fall down in the hole. I don't go this slow when I'm in the working. I'm just going slow and trying to get that, that pop noise for you. Did you hear that? So it just started here, okay? So I'm going to, you're going to hit, you, can you hear it? So then 